regional banking stocks are up close to 20% in the last month. And the question is, why was it that I went all in on my research focus into this industry. And the reason is actually a two part reason. The first reason is that banks are just generally difficult to research. You can't just pull up a stock screener and figure out which bank is the best one to invest in. You have to understand how to look at the banks, how to do the research, what specifically to really look into and what questions to ask. And the second part is that a lot of value investors, when they saw the regional banking stocks collapse, they said, nope, this is too much risk. I don't want to look into it. And so you have these two items, which becomes a value investor's dream because you have an industry that's difficult to research. So not a lot of competition in terms of people trying to do the research and dig into it really well. And two, obviously not a lot of the smart value investors are digging into it. They just rather have somebody else do it and invest into the industry. And so you end up having this dream situation, which is exactly why I went all in in the banking space when everything was collapsing. And what I want to do in this video is talk through what has happened and what's essentially what has transpired since then. And are there any other opportunities that are remaining in this space or what do the next six months look like? And so as you guys smash that like button, let me run that intro. What's up guys and welcome back to the channel. I want to see a lot of meows from the OGs of this channel. Now let's dive right into this. So you can see the S&P 500 has done well over the last month. There's been a lot of uh, optimism with the uh, with, with, with the index as a whole. A year to date, it's done very well. And you can see, of course, it got eclipsed by the uh, regional banking ETF over the last month. It's up 18 percent or just over 18 percent and specifically with my two favorite names which were u.s bank corp and citizens financial uh they actually outperformed the banking index it was interesting to see citizens lag behind a little bit but then they caught up so you can see that they outperformed a little bit uh relative to the index so you know getting 20 percent in the last month that's not a bad move now the question is how exactly did i determine that these two banks were the ones that i was going to concentrate into in fact i have another one as well and just quickly you guys would have seen this in my uh, earlier videos that I did on the regional banking space where I analyzed 63 national and regional banks using many key performance risk indicators including these nine up above here now the question you might be asking is okay yeah if I get access to this uh, banking comps how am I really going to know how to use it how am I going to uh, understand exactly what these items are how will it make sense to me and so what I did was I actually gave you guys a free regional banking analysis course which is just a part of that higher tier. Uh, it's just an added benefit. And what I did was I walked through that schedule or the comps and I reviewed all of the key performance indicators for the banks. I applied those indicators to the banks as we analyzed them. And I gave my personal ranking, my ranking changed. So the ranking that's in this video, it, it, it I modified it a little bit as I learned more about the banks. But you know, this is a two and a half hour course that, um, essentially answers quite a few of the questions that you guys may have on that. And so, you know, even if you're not investing in banks at the moment, or, uh, you know, it may not necessarily be the right place to put your capital, this really helps set up for the next time that uh, regional banks become an opportunity. But, you know, there still could potentially be opportunities in the future. And so I'm actually going to be keeping the comps tracker updated. I'll update it with the Q2 uh, uh, information. But, you know, how do you get access to it? Well, you know, there's um, this higher tier where, you know, you get access to the comp schedule and you get access to the special live courses that we have. And in fact, I've been adding more and more courses. I've been adding a, a granular budget tool for you guys as well which is coming out this month so i'm just i just keep adding more and more to this uh to make this incredibly valuable and what i'm noticing is that a lot of people who are on this lower tier are up upgrading to the higher tier they're doing it on a trial basis and then they just end up staying and so you know if you want to join us there's over 200 of us in this community now the question is what are we seeing with the banks well you know as predicted on the channel I felt like the deposit flight issue, which was what was taking down the banks, was largely a Q1 issue as deposits have now started to stabilize. Now, I think for the remaining, the, the second half of this year, all eyes are going to be on two items. One item not a lot of people are talking about and the other item people are starting to talk about. And so the first item that not a lot of people are talking about is what's called NIM compression. I will uh, dive uh, deeper into that and show you exactly how to look for it. Now, NIM stands for net interest margin. So it is the difference between what the bank 
is lending at versus what they're borrowing at. And so uh, the, the, there's a spread. If that spread, spread tightens, the bank is just less profitable. And so you want to see that uh, expand as much as possible. And that is compressing right now because more and more deposits are moving into interest bearing accounts. And then of course, the, uh, the risk that a lot of people are talking about, or I guess I'm seeing some people talk about it is portfolio risk. So what is the commercial real estate exposure? And as I've said on this channel before, commercial real estate is, uh, it is an all encompassing term, but the items in commercial real estate are different and they have different risk elements. This is where, you know, if you're a, a, a very careful investor and you do your research, you can find banks that have high amounts of commercial real estate exposure. So, you know, they are, are, are deemed as riskier. But when you dig into what exactly that commercial real estate exposure is, you notice that they actually are lower risk than uh, what the market actually believes that they are. And so, you know, overall deposits look to be stabilizing, but notice banks had to pay much more interest to keep depositors around and some relied more heavily on other high cost funding and that's the banks they're, they're uh, relying on wholesale funding and so this actually this situation here with the NIM compression might actually create another opportunity to purchase regional banks or get into banks in general in the second half of 2023 and so that's why I'm keeping my comps tracker updated and essentially what I'm doing is I'm updating all of the book value per share uh, for all of the companies on the tracker. And I'm going to add more companies to the tracker uh, because I do believe that there could be an opportunity here because not a lot of people are concerned right now about NIM compression, but I, I very much think that that could become an issue. Look, I'm saying could, uh, it may not necessarily happen, but you know, I'm going to be ready for it if, it if it does. Now, you can see with Citizens, deposits rose 3%, which was nice. M&T actually also reported a deposit increase. Uh, First Horizon, in um, deposits were also up and U.S. banks deposits were up as well. And so, you know, you can see that, um, uh, you know, deposits are stabilizing. So that risk, I think, is in the rearview mirror. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the risk stays in the rearview mirror forever. If we start increasing interest rates significantly again, there could be some weaker banks where people start moving their deposits. So you can, again, have those types of issues. So I wouldn't say that if you're going to be looking at regional banks or, or banks in general, that you're not looking at their uh, uh, loan to deposit ratio. It's still very important to keep an eye on that. And I do have the uh, comps tracker, which uh, tracks that on an annual basis. But you know, if you're looking at investing in banks, um, uh, especially now halfway into the year, you'd want to update that for yourself to make sure that the loan to deposit hasn't moved materially. And then of course, the other thing is, even if they have a low loan to deposit ratio, uh, what you still want to know is how, uh, where do some of those deposits come from? Are they wholesale or are they regular uh, cheaper deposits? And you know, are they going to be relying on more wholesale deposits if there is even even a slight uh, flight. And then what does that do to the NIM uh, of the company as a whole? We've seen quite a few banks and we talked about it on our monthly calls where their NIMs absolutely collapsed because they had a wholesale funding model or they relied more on wholesale funding than you would have thought that they would have would have had to. But you saw it just by looking at their schedules that you know what there was risk here and then it materialized. So be very careful. Now two things can be true at the same time i could have done very well with the regional banks which i did do however that doesn't necessarily mean that i can't get my butt handed to me in the second half and so these are the things that i'm looking for with regional bank earnings as we go into the second half of 2023. The first, of course, is NIM compression. And the second, of course, is portfolio risk. And, and that's commercial real estate exposure. And so in the back half of this video, I'm going to show you exactly how I look at that information and how I find it. So this here is the most important document from U.S. Bank's earnings release, but notice it was buried on page 24 of their earnings release. So if you want to find it, it's page 24 and you can follow along or you can just follow along on the screen here. But notice that this is what I mean about the net interest margin compression. Notice that, you know, they're earning assets. Uh, so this is uh, the first part of it. This is uh, this is um, uh, what they're lending at. Notice that their lending rates have definitely increased because their total earning assets were 2.88%. And then, and that was last year, last year's quarter. And then 
in 2023, this quarter, it's 2.06%. So it actually increased. However, notice that the uh, their liabilities, their interest-bearing liabilities, actually increased at a rate higher than the 2.06% at 2.2%. And that's because you were paying out at 40 basis points before, and now you're paying out at 2.6%. So that is compressing your net interest margin. So they were initially earning 2.48%. Uh, now they're earning 2.34%. Now, the all of their releases, they're going to quote this net interest margin, which has some adjusting items in it, but focus on the gross interest margin for directionality here. Uh, th there's always complicating factors. So look into the specific items that make up the net interest margins There's generally reconciliations that help you with that. But just from a directionality perspective, notice that even US Bank, even if they're going to say, look, our net interest margin actually expanded quarter over quarter, ask yourselves, why is their gross interest margin uh, 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 collapsing a little bit? Not necessarily collapsing, that's not the right word, but compressing a little bit. And so be very careful, because I think this risk continues to materialize, especially if we have um, higher and higher rate increases, which I don't think we will. I think we're kind of done with that. But, you know, there might be a couple more rate increases. But, you know, you might have more and more consumers continue to move their uh, funds over. Now, look, is there a risk here with U.S. Bank? Absolutely. Look, they have $128 billion that is, um, that is deposited at 1%. Can some of that move? Yes. Now, part of what's in here is funds that may not necessarily be able to move. Like, for example... Uh, uh, accounts that uh, companies pay payroll out of or uh, checking accounts that people pay their mortgages out of, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a natural stickiness to interest checking accounts. However, you can very clearly see that the uh, money market savings account did increase year over year. And so I think this continues to increase. I think the interest checking account might decline uh, there is some risk there. I don't exactly know how much of it that is sticky. They don't provide the guidance. So it's very hard to tell anyways. But just keep that in mind that there is this NIM compression issue, which you're even seeing with the best banks out there. And I do believe that U.S. Bank is one of the best ones out there. Now, remember I said that the commercial real estate risk is the second risk that I'm looking out for. And why am I focusing on commercial real estate? Well, recall, guys, that, you know, the work from home uh, situation never really changed. There's a lot of offices in this environment, in this higher rate environment where potentially the economy could slow, where they're looking to reevaluate their office footprints. There are still a lot of offices that are uh, remaining empty or not at full capacity. And so is there a risk three, four, five years down the road where some of these loans, um, as they come up, they are won't be able to refinance them. Do some of these buildings have to be sold, repurposed, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a, a bit of a nightmare for a lender. And so you want the lender to show you exactly how much the risk is. And so we know that commercial real estate, X office or just commercial real estate as a whole is 14% of the overall portfolio for uh, U.S. Bank, but notice that they break out the office space because, like I said, commercial real estate is an all-encompassing term, and the risk profile on everything is not the same. So you can see ma the majority of the commercial real estate is multifamily. I'm not worried about that, especially in an environment where you can't buy homes. The other one is, of course, real estate, which, again, I'm not too worried about. The only area that I'm really worried about is the office space. So that's 2% of the portfolio. Now, they're telling you that their office uh, portfolio, the origination loan to value is 55%. So you got 45% to work with. Uh, and so I think you have a very comfortable margin there uh, if you need to sell off a building. And so I think they're fine there. And then once again, they're telling you that commercial office, um, uh, commercial real estate office exposure represents 2% of the total loans and 1% of total commitment. So you're, you have very low exposure. You know, if the whole office portfolio decides to um, uh, become non-performing. I think just the, what they have on the balance sheet is good enough uh, to have already hedged for it. But essentially what I'm saying is that it's not going to uh, destroy the bank. The bank's not going to go out of business overnight with uh, a couple of major uh, office buildings um, going uh, bankrupt or, or, or those loans going bad. Now, they do speak to the credit quality of their commercial real estate portfolio as well. So I love the additional disclosure. And you can see that there's no real signs of material deterioration in the commercial real estate portfolio. Recall, guys, that I said material deterioration because we are seeing some deterioration, right? Like the non-performing loans was very low 
at 52 basis points. It's increased to 87 basis points. So that's something to keep an eye on. I'm not too worried about it, uh, especially considering that the 90 plus a day delinquencies is still at zero. So the only thing that's happened is you got some 30 to 89s. So let, next quarter, we'll see how many of these transit uh, transition themselves into the 90 plus. Uh, I suspect that it it's not going to happen or not, not a material amount of it will go into the 90 plus. But if it does, then how much of those end up in the non-performing loan? So, you know, we'll see. Um, but you know, this is just something to pay attention to, uh, their net charge off rate remains pretty low at 19 basis points. So, you know, nothing to, uh, uh be overly worried about right now, but if you're going to focus on anything, it's this slide and uh, we'll see how it plays out, uh, into the next couple of quarters. But overall, I'm not concerned about material deterioration in the commercial real estate portfolio, nothing that they can't handle. Now the risk for commercial real estate loans is actually smaller than you guys even think. And this is one item that I think I'm the only one who's really talking about. I haven't seen a lot of people talk about it. I'm really happy that Reuters actually put out this news article uh, back in late June of this year. And this is what's happening. U.S. banks are actually selling parts of their loan portfolios to private lenders. And why are they doing this? Well, it's to offload some of that excess risk that they're not comfortable holding. And so I, I put it right here. This relatively quiet earnings seasons will give the regional banks that are feeling some pressure to continue to get some risk concentration off of their books. And this should stabilize and de-risk the industry further going into the back half of 2023. So you can see that even if a bank currently reports a little bit of excess exposure with office real estate, they can offload some of that to somebody else, not even in the banking space, just private equity who wants to take on some of that additional exposure and is comfortable with the risk profile. And so overall, I think the industry de-risks more as time goes on into the back half of the year, but it's still something that we'll pay attention to. The number one issue, of course, that I'm focusing on is that NIM compression, which I don't think a lot of people have been speaking about. I've seen some of it being spoken about, but really I've been hearing the CEOs talk about it in their conference calls and not so much the news article speaking about it. So I think that will become a bigger and bigger theme as the back half of this year continues. But the, what that can do is actually create opportunities because some people might see that get scared scared, sell off these banks, and then we might get a little bit of a yo-yo effect, which of course could create some wonderful opportunities in the space. And that's what I'm going to be continuing to pay attention to. And so just because the stocks ran up doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to run back down. But of course, that means that there may be opportunity for more acquisitions of these banks at good prices. And so you guys let me know what you're seeing. If you guys are looking at this, let me know if there's indicators that you might want to see added to the comps tracker as well. And of course, I'll link to the latest video that I had on the banking industry, which you can connect to right here.